Hi there, my name is Jeremy Krug and I'd like to welcome you back to another chemistry video. In this video and in the videos that we're going to be watching in this series, this is about chemical bonding and chemical compounds. If you aren't a subscriber yet, consider subscribing to my channel. This is the place for all things high school chemistry, AP chemistry, honors chemistry. I think you'll like what you see as you look around my channel. Now, as we talk about chemical bonding in this video, it's important to realize that just as we learned in an earlier video in this uh, course, some atoms tend to lose electrons. For example, you might remember that all of the atoms in group one on that far left-hand column of the periodic table tend to lose one valence electron. For example, sodium here, I have Na, sodium, drawn with one dot next to it. That tells me that sodium has one valence electron. It is going to lose that valence electron in order to obtain an octet. We also know that some atoms tend to gain electrons. So for example, in group 17, kind of toward the, the right-hand side of the table, we have atoms like chlorine that have seven valence electrons. They're more stable. When they gain one valence electron, that gives them an octet. Well, here we have a case where we have two atoms that might be able to help each other out. We have sodium that would like to lose one electron, and we have chlorine that would like to gain one electron. Well, maybe they can help each other out if sodium actually gives an electron over to chlorine right here. Now, they're both stable. They both have that octet. They're both happy, aren't they? So we see that some atoms lose electrons, some atoms gain electrons. And when they get together like this, they can help each other out. Now this is called an ionic bond. Now basically, an ionic bond is a bond that's formed when a metal donates electrons to a nonmetal. Just like we saw in that last situation there. Sodium, the metal, donated its electron to chlorine, the nonmetal. Now, remember, just like we learned in an earlier video, when something donates electrons or when something loses electrons, it becomes positively charged. That's called a cation. And when something receives electrons or gains electrons, it becomes negatively charged. That's called an anion. So that's why I have cation and anion here. When those two ions are formed, we're going to have an ionic bond. Now remember, in order to have an ionic bond, we have to have charges, don't we? So normally that's going to be a metal and a nonmetal that get together to make that ionic bond. Now, this is not the only kind of bond. As it turns out, some atoms really aren't able to donate electrons or receive electrons. Instead, they might be doing something different. They might be sharing their valence electrons. For example, let's say we have these two atoms right here, chlorine and bromine. We can look at where they are on the periodic table, and we can see that they're both kind of toward the right-hand side there. They're in group 17. They're halogens. They have seven valence electrons. Both of them would really like to gain an electron. Well, how can these two atoms have an octet? Neither one wants to lose an electron. Well, maybe they can share. Maybe they can take these two electrons here in the middle and then share the two valence electrons between them. You see, that way, this, this chlorine atom right here can lay claim to both of those electrons. And so it can say that, that it has eight. And likewise, this bromine over here can lay claim to both of those electrons as well and say that it has eight. So now they both have that octet, they're both stable. Now this type of chemical bond is called a covalent bond. And this is what you have when two nonmetals are sharing electrons. Once again, it's gonna be two nonmetals, and a key word here is that they're sharing electrons. We're not donating or gaining or losing electrons per se, we're sharing electrons. So one thing that you need to realize is that if we have two nonmetals participating in a chemical bond, it's going to be covalent. So on a quiz or a test, you should be able to determine if two elements are going to make an ionic bond or a covalent bond. If it's a metal and a nonmetal, then it's going to be ionic. If it's two nonmetals, it's going to be covalent. Now,
if it were that easy, that would be pretty nice, wouldn't it? The fact is, there's a little bit more to this story. Because you see, some nonmetals are just not very good at sharing. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's say we have these two nonmetals, carbon and fluorine. And if you look at the periodic table, you can see that they're both on the right side of the table. They're both nonmetals. It sure looks like they should be sharing their electrons there, and we should have a covalent bond. Well, there's a little problem here. The fact is that when carbon and fluorine get together, fluorine is hogging the electrons. It's like fluorine keeps the electrons over here almost all the time, and poor old carbon doesn't get to use those electrons very often. So we can say that fluorine is a notorious electron hog. And so it's like carbon is sad because it doesn't get to use these, these electrons here. Well, here's a case where we have two nonmetals that are sharing electrons, but they're not sharing them evenly or, or equally. And this is a type of bond that we call a polar covalent bond. And a polar covalent bond is basically formed when you have two nonmetals that are sharing their electrons, but they're sharing them unequally. One of the two nonmetals in this covalent bond is an electron hog. It's hogging the electrons, like fluorine is doing in this case. So yes, it's a polar covalent bond. Now, on the other hand, some nonmetals are very good at sharing. For example, if I were to look at these two nonmetals, arsenic and tellurium, we have the two electrons there in that covalent bond. And we could look at those two electrons and, and look at these and say, yeah, they're sharing them equally. These electrons are going to spend about half the time over here with arsenic and about half the time over here with tellurium. So they're both going to be sharing very equally or very, very close to equally. Now, this is something that we call a nonpolar covalent bond. A nonpolar covalent bond is when you have two nonmetals that are sharing the electrons equally, or almost equally. As long as it's almost equal, that's, that's still nonpolar. So we have polar bonds when one of them is hogging the electrons, and then we have nonpolar bonds where they're being shared fairly equally. I guess the question that arises here is, how do you know? How can you tell whether a covalent bond is going to be polar or nonpolar? Well, let's think about it for a second. Is there something that we've learned about in this course already that helps us to decide if an atom is going to be attracting or pulling electrons toward it? Well, back in our section about electrons, we talked about something called electronegativity. And you might remember that electronegativity is just the attraction that an atom has for electrons. And so whichever atom has a higher electronegativity is going to be attracting or hogging the electrons the most, if you want to think about it in that way. Now, there actually is a chart of electronegativities. Here I have a simplified chart of electronegativities for you here. And what we can do is we can compare the two electronegativities of the two nonmetals. If you have two nonmetals that have electronegativities that are very far apart from each other, like maybe 0.5 or more of a difference, we're going to call that polar covalent, where the one that has the higher electronegativity is the electron hog. On the other hand, if you have two nonmetals that have electronegativities that are quite close to each other, in fact, their difference is, let's say, about 0.4 or less, we're going to call that a nonpolar covalent bond. Now, before we do some practice, let's just review what we've talked about here. If we take all of our chemical bonds that we've learned about so far, we can divide them into two types. We can divide them into ionic bonds, or covalent bonds. Ionic is generally going to be composed of a metal and a nonmetal, and then covalent bonds are going to be composed of two nonmetals. If it's a covalent bond, we have to go one step further and decide if it's polar or nonpolar. The polar covalent bond will have two nonmetals with an electronegativity difference greater than or equal to 0.5. If we have a nonpolar covalent bond, there are going to be two nonmetals with an electronegativity difference of less than 
Now, let's try a few examples here. My first example is sulfur and selenium. Now, we can look at the periodic table, and we can see that both of those elements are on the right side of the periodic table. They're on the right side of that stair-step line. So that means that they're both nonmetals. So we're talking about a covalent bond here. Well, since it's covalent, we have to go one step further and look at the electronegativity. So here's that chart once again. Sulfur is right here, and it's about 2.5 on the electronegativity chart. Selenium is right here. It's about 2.4 on the electronegativity chart. So subtracting the larger minus the smaller gets us 0 0.1. That's less than 0.5, isn't it? So that means this is a nonpolar covalent bond. Now, let's take a look at another combination, bromine and tellurium. So once again, we can look at the periodic table, and we can see that both of them are on the right side of the stair-step line. So they're both nonmetals for this purpose here. And so we can say that this is a covalent bond. So we're going to have to look at the electronegativities. So bromine is right here on the electronegativity chart, 2.8. And then tellurium is over here, it's 2.1 on the electronegativity chart. So when you subtract those, that's 0.7. So that's 0.5 or greater. So this is going to be a polar covalent bond. That's how you determine if something is polar or nonpolar based on electronegativities. Now, how about this other example, aluminum and nitrogen? Well, by looking at the periodic table, we can say that aluminum is a metal. Nitrogen is a nonmetal. So metal and nonmetal means it's ionic. We don't even have to look at the electronegativity chart to see that, do we? So that is ionic. I hope you've learned something about chemical bonding, the basics of chemical bonding anyway, how to determine if something is polar or nonpolar, how to determine if a bond is ionic or covalent. If you learned something, I would really appreciate it if you smashed that like button. I would really appreciate that. And if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and consider subscribing if you would. This is the place for all things high school chemistry, honors chemistry, AP chemistry, general chemistry. Hope you like this video. I hope to see you in the next video where we're going to learn about how to write some names for chemical compounds. I'll see you then.